Hello. Uh, I'm back to talk to you a little bit more about instrumental conditioning. And this time I'm going to talk to you about how instrumental conditioning may be analyzed from the perspective of behavioral economics. And uh, you might tell me, hey, that's kind of crazy. What does economics have to do with a rat pressing a bar in a Skinner box? <clears throat> Turns out behavioral economics is a, a newly emerging field in psychology, and it's also a newly emerging field in neuroscience, is neuroeconomics. And uh, economic concepts first became introduced into psychology through an analysis of instrumental conditioning some years ago. Uh, so uh, the analysis I'm going to provide actually has a lot to do with how economic concepts are being used uh, in psychology. <clears throat> now, to get into it, let's go back to uh, a slide you've seen before, which is today's first slide, which illustrates uh, this bliss point approach and uh, behavioral regulation. As you may recall here, uh, we're talking about a teenager who loves to uh, listen to music and hates to spend time studying. So the bliss point is pretty high on, on a scale of uh, spent, time spent listening to music and pretty low on time spent uh, uh, studying. Now we want the uh, teenager to spend more time studying and we, so we set up an instrumental conditioning procedure that links these two behaviors such that she has to spend a minute studying for every minute that she gets to spend uh, <clears throat> uh, listening to music. Now, what, how is uh, the teenager going to respond to this uh, schedule constraint? All instrumental conditioning procedures constrain or limit the freedom of behavior. And then the subject has to readjust and make adjustments to that constraint. Well, how uh, the teenager is going to respond to this constraint uh, depends on trade-offs. If uh, listening to music is really important, uh, and then uh, she's going to travel up the schedule line uh, until it uh, intersects the level of uh, music that uh, she uh, uh, prefers at the bliss point. Uh, and then she'll get to listen to as much music as she ordinarily likes. But notice that this is at the cost of having to increase her studying time substantially. So defending the level of uh, uh, time is spent on music is, uh, depends on how much of a cost you're willing to pay. And uh, there's the same uh, kind of uh, story goes if you try to defend uh, how little time you spend studying. That's going to be at the cost of, uh, of spending uh, and getting less access to music. And, uh, and then the question is how much of a cost you're willing to bear. Uh, so um, there are a lot of trade-offs involved. And it turns out economic concepts are really terrific for uh, analyzing these trade-offs. So how do we turn an instrumental conditioning procedure into an economic decision matrix? Well, the next slide kind of tells you um, how this goes. Uh, uh, economics, of course, has to do with spending money and uh, de making decisions about where you're going to spend your money. Now, <clears throat> you don't have money in an instrument <laughs> in a, the rat skinner box, but you have responses. And so the responses that you have to perform uh, are, in a sense, analogous to the money that you have to spend. And uh, what do you, you uh, purchase with uh, those responses? Well, you purchase reinforcers. And uh, what is the price of those reinforcers? Well, that's set by the schedule of reinforcement. So as you can see, money, goods, and price are all have their analogs in an instrumental conditioning procedure. And a lot of what economists uh, uh, deal with has to do with uh, price effects. And uh, price effects are uh, described by uh, consumer demand curves. And the next slide illustrates some hypothetical examples of consumer demand curves. Uh, so in this uh, 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 form of representation, what we're looking at is how much of an item is purchased depending on how much that costs. So increases in price are uh, displayed on the bottom axis and the number of goods, uh, a number of items of that sort that are purchased that are displayed on the y-axis. 
And you can see that in curve C, as you increase the price, the number of items purchased stays pretty stable. So that represents very little elasticity of demand. The subject is defending, it's not giving up <laughs> uh, any uh, items that he normally purchases because the price is getting uh, larger. That's in contrast to curve A. In curve A, uh, you increase the price and uh, the number of items purchased uh, plummets. And so you may uh, very well uh, ask, you know, what kind of items are fit into category A? Well, the kind of items that fit into category A that show a lot of elasticity in uh, demand, that is sensitivity to increases in price, are things that you don't really need. These are kind of luxury items uh, uh, that uh, you can do without. <laughs> the 10th pair of shoes, you don't really need 10 pair of shoes. You don't really need a concert ticket that gets you uh, within uh, 10 rows of the, of the stage. Uh, if you're 50 rows within the, from the stage, that's lesser price and that's just as good. So there are things that you don't really need. And so if you increase the price a great deal, there's going to be a quick drop off in um, the number of items that are purchased. Um, of curve B is kind of in the middle. Now to show you that <laughs> Uh, these the elasticity of demand functions, you know, these curves are, that I, uh, I'm showing you here are idealized and so forth, but they appear in economic uh, analyses. Uh, do they appear in psychology and do they appear in instrumental conditioning situations? And the answer is you bet. And so the next slide shows you an actual experiment that was done by uh, Johnson and Bekel. Bekel is, Warren Bekel is uh, one of the uh, primary uh, uh, major investigator in uh, behavioral economics. And uh, what it's got here is uh, uh, adult uh, uh, human subjects who, who uh, were smokers, okay? And uh, they had to pull a plunger in order to uh, obtain uh, puffs at a cigarette. And uh, the number of uh, responses that were required for the reinforcer progressively increased in what's called a, a progressive fixed ratio. So initially, uh, 10 responses were required and 100 and 500 and 1,000 and so on. So you're increasing the price of these puffs on a cigarette. And you can see for a while the uh, demand uh, is not sensitive to price, but then it drops off. And, uh, and the uh, field circles represent the drop off for cigarettes. Uh, in another phase of the experiment, um, the reinforcer was uh, 25 cents, and there's also a drop off in uh, uh, the demand curve for uh, for money. Uh, you can see that the elasticity of demand for uh, money uh, open circles is a little bit greater than the elasticity of demand for cigarettes. Uh, so uh, this is an illustration of demand curves in an instrumental conditioning situation. Okay, so um, from the standpoint of analysis of instrumental conditioning, uh, the uh, most important concept or things to take into account is what determines the elasticity of demand? What determines how rapidly uh, consumption drops off as an increase in uh, response requirement? And the next slide um, illustrates uh, uh, the critical factors, critical factors determining elasticity. And this is not true, not just in psychology, but in economics. Uh, one of the factors is the price range. You notice that for each of those demand curves at the low range of prices, the curves tend to be fairly flat. Uh, whereas uh, at the high end of uh, the price range, that's when you start to see drop offs in, uh, in consumption. So price range is a big, uh, important variable. Another important variable, which you can't see in the graph, is income level. If you've got pretty high income, then you're not going to be as uh, put off by a dramatic increase in price as if you have uh, pretty limited income. So income uh, level is important, and there are experiments that uh, evaluate the role of income in terms of the number of responses that the subject has to spend 
and how that affects uh, elasticity. So we've done those experiments have been done in, in an instrumental conditioning context. The third variable listed here is by far the most important factor. And this is the availability of substitutes. If there are substitutes available for the item that you're working to obtain or that you're trying to buy, uh, then as the price of an item goes up, you switch to the substitute. So in a case of gasoline that you put in your car, well, if you drive a gas powered car, uh, there's nothing else that you should put in your gas tank than gasoline. You don't want to put milk in there. You don't want to put uh, water in there. It's going to mess up your car. So uh, there are no substitutes there. And so there is relatively little elasticity in uh, demand for gasoline. As the price goes up, people tend to kind of keep filling their cars with, uh, with gasoline. Uh, in contrast, for some other items, if the price goes up, uh, you're gonna, there's going to be a huge drop in, uh, before, uh, in number of items uh, uh, purchased. Uh, uh, you might have noticed uh, in a supermarket uh, some years ago, <laughs> before you were born, uh, you could, when you went to the supermarket, you bought milk and there was uh, whole milk and uh, skim milk, maybe 2% milk and skim milk. There were two or three kinds of milk and it was milk. Now, if you go to the supermarket, there are not only whole milk and 2% milk and skim milk, uh, but there is soy milk and there is oat milk and there is almond milk. There's all kinds of milk. <laughs> I was amazed the other day I read oat milk. Uh, really? Okay. Well, uh, and uh, people start using these other forms of milk uh, in their cereal. So you can imagine if you uh, uh, drive up the price of one, they're just going to switch to another one. I mean, uh, what's the difference between almond milk and, and oat milk? I mean, don't ask me because I don't know. <laughs> anyway, if there are substitutes available, what you're going to get is a switch from the item that's become more expensive uh, to the substitute. This turns out to be huge re relevant to instrumental conditioning. So uh, if you may go back to the first slide. Okay. So uh, as you may recall here, uh, the instrumental conditioning uh, procedure involved uh, a requirement that the teenagers study for a minute in order to get access to music for a minute. Now, if you have complete control over how this teenager gets access to music, and if there are no substitutes available for enjoying music, uh, then you've then you're going to drive up studying behavior. But of course, that's not true, and uh, this is uh, unfortunately the complication of uh, of doing instrumental conditioning. In, uh, in the real world, as opposed to a limited uh, environment like a Skinner box, uh, uh, the subject can easily uh, skip, skip the instrumental constraint that you imposed and get access not to the reinforcer, but to substitutes for that reinforcer. So the uh, teenager is limited to uh, listening to music, may get uh, plenty of uh, uh, pleasure out of uh, watching uh, YouTube videos, uh, chatting with friends, uh, perhaps dancing, uh, playing video games, uh, <clears throat> going out uh, with friends, and so on. So there, there are a lot of other reinforcers that uh, may work as perfectly acceptable substitutes, which will then severely uh, limit the effectiveness of your instrumental conditioning uh, procedure. So <clears throat> what are the implications of this uh, for the consideration of instrumental conditioning in general. Well, number one, an, S, an analysis of instrumental conditioning in terms of stimuli and responses is pretty limited. Uh, that is, instrumental conditioning involves a lot more than the S, R, and O that's involved in, a, in an SR uh, kind of analysis. Instrumental conditioning uh, uh, it requires considering 
the constraint on the subject's free flow of behavior that you've imposed and considering those constraints within the full range of response and reinforcer options that the individual has and uh, on the uh, how flexible uh, the individual is in terms of uh, maintaining or giving up a, a certain level of access to a particular reinforcer. So instrumental conditioning in the real world is a really complicated uh, kind of business. And these concepts of behavioral economics uh, give us really good uh, conceptual tools uh, for uh, doing that analysis. That's my story for today. I uh, hope uh, some of it made sense to you. Uh, if you thought it's complicated, that's the whole take home message. Instrumental conditioning is not a simple deal. It involves a lot of trade offs, and how those trade offs are made depends on elasticity uh, of demand. Thanks very much. Take care.